You know, I was uh, so involved in that song that I almost forgot that I need to preach today. <laughs> Excellent clapping, you guys. You know, it is said that there are three kinds of people in the world. Those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who sit back and wonder what happened. I don't know which one of the three that you would uh, fit in, but I sometimes, oftentimes, I should say, feel that I'm somewhere in the two or uh, the three category there. You know, there's an author by name Brad uh, Meltzer. Uh, he has uh, he's written a series of uh, books uh, for small kids that's titled, Ordinary People Can Change the World. You know, he, these are small, small books for kids. Uh, the individual titles go like, I'm Harriet Tubman, I'm Saka Gawiya, I'm Jim Henson, I'm Jackie Robinson, I'm, I'm uh, George Washington. You know, anywhere from names that are well known to names like, I need to Google and search who this person is. Like these names that I just read out, I didn't know who they were. But uh, these people fit in category one. They made things happen. You know, as we are in our uh, series uh, this summer on Bible characters, my desire is to uh, look at the life of an ordinary man who did some extraordinary things for the Lord. An ordinary man who did some wonderful things for the Lord from uh, the life of Elijah. This week and next week in the will of the Lord, we're going to take a look at Elijah. Elijah is a very prominent character in the Bible, isn't he? a very famous prophet in the Old Testament. And even in the New Testament, the name Elijah is mentioned about 29 times that talks about how famous he was in the Old Testament. Remember the guy by name Zacharias in Luke chapter 1 when he was inside the temple, the angel of God appeared to Zacharias and he said like this uh, about John the Baptist, it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. You know, once uh, the priests and the Levites came to John the Baptist and said, you know, looking at his power, looking at the way he ministered, looking at the people who were coming to him in repentance, they were asking, are you Elijah? He said, I'm not Elijah. I mean, looking at Jesus... They said, are you Elijah? Are you one of the prophets? And then you see Elijah in Matthew chapter 17 when the Lord Jesus Christ took Peter, James, and John up on the mountain and there Jesus was transfigured in front of them and who were there? Moses and Elijah. And then in Revelation chapter 11 in the end time events during the tribulation time, it is speculated for good reasons that one of the two witnesses who would appear here on earth during the tribulation time would be Elijah. Because it is said about them that these two will have the power to shut up the sky so that rain will not fall during the prophesying. And the power to turn water into blood and the power to strike the earth with plague as often as they desire. Two powerful people, and it's very, very possible that one of them could be, could be Elijah. And of course, Elijah was taken up to heaven in a, in a whirlwind. Fantastic character. A lot of things that we can learn from Elijah. Would you turn your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 17, please? 1 Kings chapter 17. Let's read verse 1. Now, Elijah the Tishbite, whatever Tishbite means, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. That's all the introduction to Elijah. There you go. The guy just appears in the palace in front of King Ahab, tells the message, and then goes away. Boom, that's it. I mean, Ahab was like, who let this guy enter my palace? He says, as the Lord lives. Who is this guy? Where is he coming from? What happened? And uh, he says, 
there shall neither do nor rain these years. These years, Ahab probably must have asked, these years, how many years are you talking about? And then he's gone. Can you catch that guy? I just want to know how many years is he talking about? These years, that's it, he's gone. Elijah must have, been a very, must have been very serious about this message that during the time of Ahab, there will neither be dew nor rain except by the word of Elijah. This is where Tishbe, or I don't know how you say that, Tishbe is on the uh, east side of Jordan. So he was coming from the east side of Jordan by Ramad Gilead there, and then he went all the way to Samaria. Samaria is the place where Ahab was as the king of uh, the northern tribe of Israel, which we'll look at in a moment. And he went all the way just for a one-sentence message. Except by my word, there will be no rain in your days. You know, what amazes me, what amazes the reader of this passage here in 1 Kings chapter 17 is this. Now, this is the rule of a king by name Ahab. Now, Ahab was not a good king if you knew anything about Ahab. And in that time, the kingdom was divided as the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom after the reign of Solomon. After Solomon, there was a son by name Rehoboam. And Rehoboam was not a good guy. He was instrumental in splitting the kingdom. So there was a southern kingdom which is in the south. And then Jerusalem is the capital of the southern kingdom, and Samaria is the capital of the northern kingdom, which is the kingdom of Israel. And this guy Ahab, as I said, was a wicked king. Now Ahab's father, his name is Omri. And Omri was the guy who built the city of Samaria. It is said about Omri that Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord and acted wickedly than all that were before him. Now, who was this? This was Ahab's father, who did wickedly before all the kings of the northern tribe of Israel who were before him. Do you know how many, how many kings were good kings in the, in, the, in the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom? It's very easy to uh, remember. It's zero. No good king. Everyone did evil in the sight of the Lord. They were all bad kings. You know, their first king by name Jeroboam, he was a very bad guy, and he built two golden calves in the northern kingdom, and he set it up for the people to worship these two golden calves. So they took the hearts of the people away from God, and he focused them onto these two calves. And the sin of Jeroboam continued in every single king that followed him. And you will read as you read the book of First and Second Kings that the kingdom or the, that the altars of Israel, the altars were not removed. And they acted in the sins of Jeroboam. The altars were not removed. Some of them were kind of okay kings, like Jehu was, a, was an okay king. But then they did not remove the altars. So the sin of Jeroboam was very prevalent. And in, ad, in addition to that, King Ahab brought in the false worship or the foreign worship into his kingdom. He married a woman by name Jezebel, and he is the daughter of a guy by name Ethbal, who is the king of the Sidonians. Remember that for a second because we, we come back to that later in the message. He was the king of Sidonians. There was a kingdom called Sidon or the area called Phoenicia, which is north of, uh, north of this northern kingdom there. And uh, this king ruled over that place. And Ahab went and married the daughter of the king of Sidon, whose name was Jezebel. So when he marries this woman, what does he do? There's already false worship in the country. Now he's not only having false worship, but he's also having foreign worship. Baal was brought. And by the way, if you want to say it as Baal or Baal or Baal, you'll be a little technical if you want to say Baal. You can call any way you want it, just an idol. So I might go back and forth between Baal and Baal or Baha'u uh, just to show you how confused and indecisive I am. 
But Baal is the Canaanite god of fertility who's responsible to produce crops and children. Baal worship was rooted in sensuality and involved in ritualistic prostitution in the temples. You know, added to that, Baal worship also included sacrifices of the firstborn children. Imagine that. Your firstborn children will be sacrificed, not voluntarily, but be forced to be sacrificed for this God. And there were fertility poles called asherims that were set up as a homage to Asherah. Asherah is the, is the mother of Baal, uh, the Canaanite in the Canaanite mythology. And Jezebel started systematically killing the true prophets of Baal. Okay? Can you imagine the situation there that was at that time? There was false worship. There was foreign worship. There was sacrifice of the firstborn. There were idols all over the place. There were two golden calves. And added to that, Jezebel was killing the prophets, the true prophets of God. And that's why if you thought Omri was the wickedest king at that time, Ahab was more wicked than, than his father Omri. It is said about Ahab, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than all the kings of Israel who were before him. All the kings of Israel. Just 50 years after Solomon passed away, the kingdom got divided and Israel went into the depth of depravity right there. And that's where God raises a man by name Elijah, whose name is Yahweh, is God, or Jehovah is God. What a, what a character he would have been, isn't it? In that time period, and it speaks a lot about the background of this man, wouldn't it? And he says later in chapter 19, you know, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. The sons of Israel have forsaken the covenant. Very bad days in the history of the nation of Israel. Are these the days of Elijah? Are the days of Elijah so much different than it was, than it is, sorry, today? You know, we sang the song, These Are the Days of Elijah, it was written by a man named Robin Mark. You know, Robin Mark wrote this song back in 1994. You know, he, he um, talks about the reason why he wrote this song. He was watching the review of the year in 1994, and that was the year of the Rwandan Civil War tragedy. I don't know how many of you remember that. The Rwandan uh, Civil War tragedy that ended up in the massacre of close to a million Tutus, a group called Tutus, by a group called Hutu, Hutu sorry, Tutsis and Hutu. The Hutu was the majority um, um, government there, and they massacred about a million people in 100 days. And Robin writes, writes like this, I found myself despairing about the state of the world and in prayer began asking God if he was really in control and what sort of days were we living in. And God answered that prayer for him and he said that he would need a man. He would need men of power and integrity like Elijah. The world hasn't changed in 24 years. In fact, I think most of you would agree with me that it's gotten worse. You know, if child sacrifice was an abominable act at that time, if we shudder at the, at the fact that there were child sacrifices at that time, what about today? What about the saline abortions? You know, the worst place for the babies to be in today, you know where it is? I read somewhere that it is in the wombs of the mothers. It's murdering a baby by crushing its skull as it is being born worse than the pagan sacrifice to the idols? I bet. If the sexual immorality of the days of Ahab was bad, it is worst in the history of mankind Today, and we are living in the heart of it, living in the heart of it if we were living in any place in the world where 
immorality prevails at its highest. An author by name David Davis quotes like this, in a world of moral madness, one of three American children are born out of wedlock. And we don't have problem with premarital sex. Shame us, shame on us. Shame on us and on our society. Repentance is a bygone word. Living together in sin has just become the norm of the culture today. And he says, we are, fatherless. We are a fatherless generation where half the world's children know no father. The holy covenant of marriage and the family are under savage attack. Alternate lifestyle is given equal moral value. And this is the era of pornography, inundated with every form of it and every side. We are inundated by it. If Jezebel's time was a time of sex, materialism, and occult practice, and I want to tell you, nothing has changed today. Nothing has changed today. Is God looking for people like Elijah? You better believe it. Okay, so where did it all begin? Let's look at verse 1 again. Now, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord lives, the God of Israel, before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except, except by my word. And if you read a verse like this for the first time, you would think that Elijah is a man of such courage, and that he's bold. Now he's carrying the, the message of judgment. Now he's not saying, this is what God says. You know, he's not saying, God is saying that there won't be rain for three or these days, for these many years, whatever. He's saying, unless by my word. It is his word. So you would think he's a man of such power. He's a spiritual giant. He is an extraordinary man. Not really. That's why I want to turn your attention to James chapter 5. If you can turn there, please. James chapter 5 and verse 17. It goes like this. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. I want to pause there. Elijah was a man with nature like ours. Now, when was it written? It was written after Elijah died. <laughs> it's a New Testament. James wrote it. After all the supernatural and, and, and the powerful effects of what Elijah did passed by, James is writing, hey guys, listen, Elijah is a man having a nature like ours. And Ivy says, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. Young's literal translation says, Elijah was a man like affected as we are. He's affected in all the ways like we are. A man of flesh and blood, a man of fears and troubles, a man with times of joy, times of despair. We're going to see next week if you come that he got into depression. A man like Elijah, such a big and huge personality that he is. Man who had times of tr stress, man who had inner struggles, and so on. And an ordinary man. An ordinary man who ended up doing what was needed at that time. I don't think he was planning for something big. I don't think he was planning for something spectacular. He was just doing what was needed at that time. From chapters uh, 17 and 18, I want to leave with you four legacies from the life of Elijah. First of all, we see in Elijah a legacy of power that was soaked in prayer. A legacy of power that was soaked in prayer. I want to go back to James 5.17. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Here is a man who we see on his bended knees for the plight of the nation. Now, either in James chapter 5 or in 1 Kings chapter 17, as I said earlier, you don't really see that God was the one who was, or he wasn't really carrying the word of the Lord as saying, as prophets 
usually do, and he did, saying, this is what God says. Now in James 5, it says, he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. Now I'm guessing, this is a guess, that Elijah was looking at the condition of the nation of Israel at that time. The occult practices, the moralities, the false worship, the foreign worship that have been brought in. And he, as a man who carried the name, Yahweh is God, he was zealous for the Lord and he started praying. He started banging on the doors of heaven. And he started praying earnestly. And maybe I'm thinking that he started praying, Lord, just pass judgment on this nation if that's what is going to turn these people back to you. If that's what, is take, if that's what it would take to kill the prophets of Baal, to kill the prophets of Asherah, then bring the judgment on it right now. He prayed earnestly. Why was Elijah a man of power? Because he was a man of prayer. He wouldn't let go unless he got an answer. Little did he know that he was the answer to his prayer. But nevertheless, there was power because there was prayer. Now you want to face the Ahabs of the world? You want to, pray, want to face the Jezebels of the world? You pray. And there are certain demons of which the Lord Jesus Christ said, these kind of demons will not come out unless you pray and fast. It won't come out. You know, why do we see believers falling prey to some of the sins that I mentioned earlier? Why is that? Because I believe, as Hebrews says in chapter 12 and verse 4, you have not resisted to the point of shedding blood, blood in your striving against sin. You have not shed blood, which means you are not trying enough. Why do we succumb to the lusts of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of the life, and the list goes on and on and on because we have not taken things to the Lord in prayer. We are powerless when we are prayerless. You know, God wants men and women of prayer, isn't it? You know, everything about gospel is about power. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the Power of God unto salvation. It starts with power. The gospel life starts with power. It continues in power. It ought to continue in power. That's why Paul uh, said to the Ephesian believers that he prays like this. Uh, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what, the, what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. There is an immense power to us who believe. When people of the world fall in sin and wallow in sin, as believers, we don't have to. We should have the audacity and the courage to be able to face the Ahabs and the Jezebels of the world because he who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world. God wants us to be powerful. God wants us to be powerful, the power to take the message of the gospel, the power to live a humble life, the power to live victorious Christian living. You know, if you are a brother or a sister struggling with the lust of your eyes, lust of the flesh and pride of life, gossip, jealousy, covetousness, evil intent on your fellow brothers and sisters, I want to tell you, you are a weak brother. You are a weak sister. But you can face the Ahabs. You can face the Jezebels of the world when there is a private practice of praying on the bended knees, the legacy of power that is soaked in prayer. And secondly, a legacy of obedience that was learned in solitude. If you look at the verse 2, the word of the Lord came to him saying, go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. So one message for Elijah in the palace and he's out. Now where is God taking him? If you look at the map there, see so he was in Samaria. Now he goes east. 
crosses Jordan, crosses his native place, Tishbe, and he goes a little further east and north where there was the brook of Cherith, or Kerith, however you want to call it. His short assignment was over. So at one point, Elijah told Ahab that unless or except by his word, there wouldn't be rain. And in chapter 18, verse 1, we're going to see that God tells Elijah, go tell Ahab there's going to be rain. So between these messages, in the three and a half year time period, it is amazing to see what God does with his man, with his messenger Elijah, as he prepares him for the bigger message that he would deliver in chapter 18. He goes to, uh, he goes to Cherith. And in chapter 18, we're going to see that Ahab would go to to this place called Mount Carmel. And Elijah would, would, would encounter the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah in Mount Carmel, which is actually west of Samaria. So Elijah would have calculated in his mind, Lord, it, it looks like I need to be going. If I want to face the prophets of Baal, if I want to face the prophets of Asherah, I need to be going west, shouldn't I, Lord? I mean, that's what I'm going to meet these guys. That's what I'm going to encounter them. Now you're going to you're, going to, you're directing me to the east. Is this the right path, Lord? Are you making mistakes? In case you didn't know, God doesn't make mistakes. You know, in Elijah's case, God wanted him to purposely go east to the brook called Cherith because he wanted him to learn the lesson of more obedience as he wanted to deal with him in solitude. You know, God teaches special lessons in secret places. You know, God is really good in one-on-ones. You know, when you are in solitude, which means when you're alone, stop complaining. Stop complaining that you're alone all by yourself. You don't have anybody to be with. I have no friends to, to hang around with. And on and on and on. That could be the God sent time for you to learn obedience. I mean, it is an important place that God had to take him. And what kind of obedience was Elijah uh, showing here? Look at verse 5. Verse 4, it shall be that you shall drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. How would you like a menu card? And a waiter or a waitress, I don't know, who's raven? It doesn't sound good to me. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. That's what I wanted to point, point at in verse 5. He went and did according to the word of of the Lord. There was no complaining, no questions asked. Lord, why Cherith? My house is pretty close by Tishbe. Why don't I take a break here? And then let me go to Cherith. Why ravens, Lord? Aren't those the unclean birds? How about some eagles? And just meat? Twice a day, just meat and, and bread? No change in menu? I don't know, maybe six months or ten months, same thing over and over again? What kind of bread are you going to provide, Lord? I like sourdough, by the way. Can you provide? No complaint whatsoever. He went and did according to the word of the Lord. You know, God's important lessons are learned in obedience. You know, God's important lessons are learned in obedience. And also, God's important lessons are learned in a state of contentment, in a state of contentment. A whiny person never learns God's lessons. A whiny person never sees God's miracle. You know, if, if, if Elijah had not obeyed, he would not have seen the Lord provide him food by the ravens. And when the whole country was going through famine, the Lord was providing for him in a, in a hidden place. What do you do when you're alone today? Ask God. Ask God to show you some miracles. Ask God to show you what are some of the answered prayers that he, he has done in your life. Sing praises to God. 
Pray more. Read some good books. Read the Bible. I mean, there are a lot of things that can be done where the Lord can shape our lives and move us and motivate us and encourage us when we are alone. But obviously, we have a lot of distractions today, isn't it? Elijah learned the lesson of obedience. So we do see the legacy of uh, obedience that was learned in uh, solitude. The story is getting interesting now. Though in verse 9, the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Where is the Lord asking him to go? He's asking him to go all the way to Zarephath. Remember I asked you to remember a particular name? Remember that? Sidon. The Sidonians. Now Zarephath is in Sidon. It's in Phoenicia. So who is the person who is from Sidon we talked about? That was Jezebel. I mean, she is the one who brought the Baal worship to, uh, to, to, to Israel, isn't she? She's the one who, is, um, who, is, who has slaughtered the prophets of God in the land of Israel, isn't she? Now, God is saying, go all the way from Cherith, cross over Jordan, go up north, go to Phoenicia, and stay there. And Elijah would stay there. For, for about uh, three years or so in this three and a half, three and a half year period. And there he goes to, uh, to uh, Zarephath and he meets a widow there who had a son and he asks for water. And, um, and then as she was going to take water, he says, by the way, can you bring me some food? Bring me a piece of bread. And that was kind of the embarrassing moment for the, for the women. Uh, you know, a, a, a very uh, good version would, would say, the words of the woman, like, you know, I'm, I'm poor. I only have, like, a last meal here. Uh, and maybe an extreme version would say, like, are you crazy? You know, there's famine in the land, and you're coming here. I don't know you. I've never seen your face. You asked me for water. It was a courtesy. I just bring you water, and we are asked for food. Get out of here. But not this woman. And she says, I only have a little flour that I uh, have enough to prepare uh, food for me, and then my, I and my son are going to die, which means I'm going to eat this my last meal. After this, I don't have meal. I'm going to die later. And Elijah promises her not to fear, and that uh, the bowl of the flour will not be exhausted, nor the jar of oil be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. But I want to... Uh, bring our focus to the passage in verses uh, 17 through 24. And after these things happened, the son of that woman died. Let's pick it up in verse 17. Now it came about after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became sick, and his sickness was so severe that there was no breath left in him, which means he died. So she said to Elijah, What do I have to do with you, a man of God? You have come to bring, me, bring to me to bring my iniquity to remembrance and to put my son to death. And he said to her, give me your son. And then he took him from the bosom and carried him to the upper room where he was living and laid him on his own bed. He called to the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, have you also brought calamity to the wilderness with whom, or sorry, the widow with whom I'm staying by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and called to the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, I pray you that this child's life return to him. The Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the life of the child returned to him, and he revived. Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. Elijah said, see, your son is alive. The principle that I want to bring in this passage is the principle of a legacy of utter dependence in the God of resurrection. An utter dependence in the God of resurrection. He takes the body. He takes it to the upper room. He stretches himself on this child three times. And he calls on the Lord and says, Oh Lord, my God, I pray the child's life return to him. Once, didn't happen. Twice, didn't happen. Thrice, it did happen. What was he praying for? He was praying for the child's life 
to return to him. Does he even realize what he was asking? Because in the history of mankind, there has never been a resurrection before this particular incident that we know of. That's faith. The name of God is being tarnished. The name of God is being brought down and she is saying she is a, she is a, um, a heathen woman. She's a Gentile. And here is an opportunity for God's name to be honored. And she says, what do I have to do with you, O man of God? I mean, she was thinking that Elijah was the man of God. And there was the miracle of the flower and the oil that she was seeing right in front of her eyes. And boom, all of, the, all of a sudden, the only hope in her, in her life, the son, died. And Elijah's faith and dependence on the Lord led him to a place where he shows that the God of the Bible in the deepest crisis can be trusted. Can be trusted. Where did he learn that from? I don't know where he learned it from. Probably, as he was saying, as he would say later in chapter 19, that he was zealous for the Lord from the beginning, which means he probably was a follower of the living God, probably learned from Abraham's life where he was about to offer his son Isaac, and he said, God is able to bring him back to life. And he did it by faith. Maybe he did. We do not know. And maybe that's why he won the woman for the Lord. Maybe this is why it says in Hebrews 11.35, women received back their dead by resurrection, by faith. And he was impactful. Do you have stories in your life where God just intervened and showed his power? Where if it was not for God you would have been doomed. Maybe it's a financial crisis. Maybe it was, it was a disease in the family. Maybe it was relationships. Maybe it was relationship between the husband and wife or between the parents and the children. Do you have stories like that? If you do, it'll be worth sharing to somebody that, that um, you could encourage with. Paul said in uh, 2 Corinthians 1.9, Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. So it's not a physical thing that we see in the, in the book of 1 Kings. In situations in life, there has to be a place where we trust, not just in God, not just believe in God, not just put faith in God, faith in God who raises the dead. And there comes a power out of that that would impact lives. That kind of faith is what was needed to impact this woman. The man of God is ready now to face Ahab. And the story goes that he goes to, uh, to Ahab and he says, and Ahab says, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? And Elijah says, it's not me, but it's you, your father's house. You have forsaken the commandments of the Lord. So he goes now from Zarephath to Mount Carmel. And he, and he tells, um, tells um, Ahab, why don't you send all the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah down to Mount Carmel? I don't know why Ahab decided to do that bad choice. He sends 400 of the prophets 450 of the prophets of Baal and 400 of the prophets of Asherah down there. And then it's a fantastic story. You can go home and read how, how Elijah defeated the 850 of the prophets of Baal and Asherah. And the final legacy that I want to leave with you is a legacy of determination to deal with the idols of the day. Elijah said, Seize them all and don't let one of them escape. I really wanted to be there to witness that. Not one of them escaped. And Elijah became the reason for the rain to come because he, he was determined to deal with the idols of the day. 
You know, you want blessings in your life. You want God to take you and use you. You got to burn your idols. You got to defeat your idols. You got to deal with your idols. And Elijah told Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of the roar of heavy showers. And he goes up to Mount Carmel in, um, in, in chapter 18. And it says, and uh, he alone went to Mount Carmel and he crouched down on the earth and put his face between his knees. What was he doing there? You know, idols were all taken care of. They were all killed. But he goes up further on Mount Carmel. He puts his feet between, he puts his head between his knees. He crouches down. And what was he doing? He was praying earnestly that it would rain again. And then it says in uh, verse 45, it came about in a little while, chapter 18, that the sky grew black with clouds and wind, and there was heavy shower, and Ahab rode with Jezreel, and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and outran Ahab to Jezreel. What are the idols in your life? Is your idol your son, your daughter, your family, your dollars, your job? Those have to be slain. Those have to go and go to Mount Carmel. Those have to be dealt with. If the Lord, if you want the Lord to send the showers of blessing in your life. Are these the days of Ahab? I bet. These are still the days of Ahab. But the question is, are these still the days of Elijah? Will God see Elijah's raised up today to deal with the Ahabs of the world, to stand for the truth, to stand in the gap so that the immoral standards of the world does not creep in to the church and in the lives of the believers? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for Elijah, a man full of power. And we realize that his power was not because he was a superman. Not because he was an extraordinary human being. He was a normal person with a nature like ours. But he was able to stand there before the king because he, he knelt before the God of the universe. And help us to be like Elijah. Lord, we know that we live we still live in the days of Jezebel and the days of Ahab. And Lord, we know that you're seeking and looking for people who would stand in the gap. Let that be us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.